Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is easily one of the most controversial laws in the United States and potentially even in the entire world. Both President Biden and President Trump, while they were sitting presidents, said they wanted to repeal or amend the law. The problem is, while everyone seems to have an opinion on Section 230, no one really seems to know the story behind it, how it came to be, or why it still exists. My name's Liam, and I'm a lawyer that helps entrepreneurs overcome legal challenges. Today I want to talk about Section 230. I want to tell you that story. So let's jump right into it. For those unfamiliar with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, it's the law that protects Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and other social media and internet companies from being sued for spreading false information. The exact text from the act is as follows. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Now I understand that that means nothing to most people. It is some real legalese. So to better understand what that actually means, let's take a look back at the history of the law. We need to go back more than 70 years to Los Angeles in the 1950s. See, at the time, the United States is going through a series of cases in the Supreme Court around the freedom of expression. It was the Cold War, and social and cultural pressures had caused many freedoms to be infringed upon. Many forms of literature and expression were being monitored or banned by local, state, and federal government. For context, the United 50s was when the U.S. House of Representatives founded the House Un-American Activities Committee. The government was monitoring the activity of its own citizens to ensure that they were not promoting communism and other un-American ideas within the United States. Almost all of their actions were later found to be unconstitutional, but there was a serious problem in the 1950s around balancing order and freedom. The specific case that is of interest to us is the case of Elazar Smith versus the state of California. Elazar Smith was the owner of a bookstore in Los Angeles. At the time, Los Angeles had an ordinance that made it illegal for and I quote, any person to have in his possession any obscene or indecent writing or book in any place of business where books are sold or kept for sale. See, unbeknownst to Mr. Smith, he had an erotic book for sale in his store. And under this law, he was sentenced to 30 days in jail. He appealed this and the case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, which rules that the Los Angeles ordinance is unconstitutional because there's no way that a distributor like a bookstore can possibly review every single book in its store and knows every single page of every book that it sells. So this is the key. The courts here are drawing a distinction between a publisher, someone who edits a book, who reviews the work, so think of someone like Penguin Publisher or the New York Times, and a distributor like a bookstore or a newsstand, which is just a place where you go to find these works. So now the Supreme Court has that a distributor is only liable if they know or should have known that what they're distributing is illegal. Having established this difference between a publisher and a distributor, let's fast forward 40 years to the 1990s. Now we're in a new era where the internet is just starting to enter the mainstream, and sites like AOL are being founded to help people connect and communicate online. In this early internet, there's two long forgotten websites. The first is CompuServe, and the second is Prodigy. Both of these sites allow their users to post content online and both get sued for content posted by their users. The case of Stratton Oakmont vs. Prodigy is the most famous, so let's start there. You may already be thinking, I've heard that name, Stratton Oakmont, and yes, it's the same Stratton Oakmont as in The Wolf of Wall Street. And ironically, they're suing Prodigy because a user posted online accusing that company of being engaged in fraud. While we all know today that that was actually true, at the time it wasn't public knowledge, so Stratton Oakmont sues Prodigy, and they actually win. Prodigy had taken a proactive approach in creating a safe online community. They monitored all content on the site and created community guidelines to avoid inappropriate comments and discussions. While this may seem like a positive, it actually hurt them, because in this case, the courts decide that what they are doing is similar to a newspaper editor or a publisher. Essentially, they're reviewing all content before it goes online, and therefore, they're a publisher. They're responsible for everything that is said on their sites. On the flip side, CompuServe was the Wild West. Zero regulation on the site, you could say whatever you wanted, no consequences, and when they were sued, the court said, well, this looks a lot more like a newsstand or a bookstore. They're just distributing the content. They're not actually a publisher. They don't know what is being said. 
So they actually win their lawsuit and they're not responsible for any of the content on their sites. So now you can see the issue. The law as it was written prior to section 230 of the Communications Decency Act encouraged websites not to moderate because that would put them in the class of distributor, not publisher, which meant no moderation meant no legal liability. Moderation of any kind meant legal liability. So in 1996, Congress passes Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which said that those internet sites would not be treated as publishers. What this means now is that they can moderate as much or as little as they want, and they will never be responsible for the content on their site. While Section 230 jumped into the spotlight during the 2016 election, we can see from its history that it's actually a very complicated and intricate area of law. And while the current political issues are what's bringing it to our attention today, the first few cases under Section 230 were actually far more disturbing and far more important than the current issues around it. The first case was in 1997, just a year after the law was passed, and it was Xeron v. America Online. In this case, just six days after the Oklahoma City bombing, anonymous accounts started advertising items for sale with slogans that were supporting the bombings, and they gave Mr. Xeron's phone number to call to purchase the items. These posts were made on AOL and continued to appear for two weeks, and as a result, Mr. Zeron received a bunch of threatening calls, and the FBI had to place his house under protective custody. At the height of the problem, he was receiving about 30 calls an hour threatening to kill him. Mr. Zeron lost his business and ended up on psychiatric medication as a result of the ordeal and sued AOL for not removing the posts. The court ruled that Section 230 gave them immunity from these types of lawsuits, and Mr. Zeron lost the case. The second case was Jane Doe v. America Online in 2001. It featured a mother suing AOL after a man had used AOL to lure her 11-year-old son, engage in sexual acts with him, film them, and then use AOL to sell and market those videos on AOL chat rooms to other pedophiles who were buying them. Again, despite AOL allowing child porn to be marketed and sold on their website, the court ruled that they had blanket immunity because of Section 230. These early cases show that the law really didn't strike a balance at all. It just gives internet companies a blank slate to do whatever they want, and they will never ever be held accountable for their actions or inactions. Today, the issue has become very political. It started with President Trump's 2016 campaign and continued through his subsequent presidency, where the role of platforms in moderating content was really brought into the political spotlight. On the Democratic side, we have politicians like Nancy Pelosi that argue that these platforms need to be held responsible for the fake news and propaganda that appears, particularly when such propaganda is being paid for by foreign governments. On the Republican side, you had Donald Trump and Ted Cruz and others who believe that social media sites can't moderate because moderation is unfair, because that site inherently then needs to make decisions about what is true or false, right or wrong. And this brings up a lot of interesting questions about whether this is infringing the freedom of expression of Americans. One of the biggest misconceptions, however, about Section 230 on both sides of the aisle is that it's supposed to allow platforms to be neutral and enforce rules equally, but legally. That's not true at all. The idea was to avoid a situation like Prodigy and to let every platform decide its own rules and to moderate however it sees fit without any legal consequence. And while that may have worked in the 1990s, it's a serious question today whether that still fits with a society where Twitter, Facebook, and other social media platforms are now the primary method of communication for millions of people, including the president and other important political figures. The current law as it is almost allows these platforms to handpick our political leaders. They could censor all content without any legal repercussion. Overall, this is an extremely complex issue and one that won't be resolved overnight. The goal of this video wasn't to persuade you to pick a particular solution, but to provide the historical context and show how Section 230 works in practice. Much of the problem with the debate around Section 230 is that politicians continuously frame it as a positive obligation for companies to moderate in a neutral way. That's not what it is either on paper or in practice. It's a legal immunity that allows them to do what they want. This positioning of the law by politicians is just a way for them to avoid responsibility for having passed the law that is allowing the current situation where false news can run rapidly on social media. Now, if you have an idea about how Section 230 can be improved, or if you think it should be eliminated completely, 
Let me know in the comments. I would love to start a real open discussion here about how we can improve online communication moving forward. And if you like this video, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could like, subscribe, and share it with your friends.